Okay, uh, we're going to kick off the, uh, the afternoon keynote now and I'm delighted to introduce Katie Miller who's come all the way from London, UK for our mini conference today. So uh, she works at Facebook, we're very glad that they have lent her to us. Katie, uh, of course, is well known in the uh, Australian functional programming community, having been a, uh, a very active organiser of the Brisbane Functional Programming Group for some years uh, and involved in functional programming conferences and education around Australia. So I'm delighted to uh, invite her up to give her afternoon keynote, Haskell is not for production and other tales. Welcome, Katie. Thanks, Grace. So yes, my name is Katie, although in this crowd I'm sometimes known as Katie One because there is another Katie, the lovely Katie McLaughlin here, also known as Katie Two. And Katie, this other Katie, is one of the two organisers, as you've probably noticed, of this mini conf event today. Uh, I wonder if we could just take a moment now to thank Katie and Fraze for all of the hard work they've put into this day. I think you'll agree that this has been really awesome. I hope we'll have more uh, functional programming mini comps to come. So I trust I'm among friends here when I admit that I am a bit of a functional programming addict. Uh, in fact, I've been known to be one of those enthusiasts who tries to slip functional programming in at work uh, almost by stealth. Maybe you're familiar with this type. Uh, they do things like deciding to write the prototype for the new PHP system in Scala, or slipping in uh, cheeky comments into the Java code base about what something might look like if it were written in Haskell, or the classic one, running impromptu monad tutorials in the lunchroom when someone dares to bring burritos for lunch. So yes, I was one of those. Last year, though, uh, I landed my dream job at Facebook and went from functional programming enthusiast to a fair dinkum Haskell professional. Were you all good? Yep, we're done. Uh, and I've discovered since then <laughs> uh, that lots of other developers find this kind of hard to compute. So I find myself repeatedly having conversations that go something like this. Ah, like, oh, so you're an engineer. What do you code in? Oh yeah, I, I mostly write in Haskell. Oh, Pascal, cool. <laughs> Wait, no, 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 no. Not Pascal, Haskell, like the functional language. Wait, what? Really? Haskell? I haven't seen that since university. You use Haskell at work. You have Haskell in production at Facebook. So I'm not really sure why people subliminally seem to find Pascal more likely than <laughs> Haskell. <laughs> but nonetheless, yes, a company once famed for moving fast and breaking things is using a technique renowned for helping developers to move fast and not break things. Facebook does indeed run Haskell in production. Uh, in fact, we have what we believe is probably the largest Haskell deployment uh, in existence. Haskell is at the heart of a system called Sigma that handles more than one million requests a second. So why is this surprising? Why is this a shock for people? I think it's because Haskell is surrounded by a lot of myths and misconceptions. People who've never even seen a line of Haskell code often have some kind of preconceptions about it. And one of those myths is that Haskell is not for production. It's not for the real world. So today I want to explore that and some of the other common stereotypes and compare and contrast them with the experiences that I've had uh, since I've started working with Haskell at Facebook. So I'm going to tackle three different stories. Firstly, that Haskell is academic, that Haskell is difficult, and that Haskell is panacean. And to be clear, the opinions in this talk are my own, not my company, so you can feel free to come along to the pub later and debate them with me. I am not going to be answering questions in this session or responding to heckles. Um, so if you have questions, please come find me later. I'll be uh, around all week, so I'm happy to, to answer things offline. So landing a job at Facebook was uh, a dream come true for me for multiple reasons. I now get to write Haskell every day, which is awesome, as I've mentioned. Uh, I live in London, which is also a, a, you know, an amazing city and a great experience. And I also have the opportunity to do what I think is really interesting, impactful work, which is building tools to help fight spam at scale. So the running example I'm going to be using today is the Haskell project that I work on, which is called Haxel, although much of what I'm going to talk about uh, in this presentation actually is applicable to functional programming more generally too. 
So what's Haxel? Uh, so in this talk, I'm just going to give a really brief high-level overview. There are other presentations that have been done by my colleagues and blog posts, and actually there's also a paper where you can go in and delve into the details of, of how this thing works uh, and the journey also of getting into production. But just to give you a basic idea, uh, Haxel is a Haskell framework uh, that is used in a system called Sigma. So this is a system I mentioned earlier that handles more than a million requests a second. And Sigma is a rules engine that's used for uh, fighting spam, malware, malicious URLs, and other nasty things that people want to put on Facebook, Instagram, Messenger. So Sigma is used to classify tens of billions of user actions per day. So it needs to be fast, it needs to be effective, uh, efficient, and uh, obviously a scalable system. So here's the basic use case. Well, you can barely see that. So where that white is, is actually a picture of a user. So a user comes along and, <laughs> great contrast, um, does some kind of write action uh, on one of these systems. So maybe they're trying to write a status update on Facebook. Maybe they're writing a message on Messenger. And that needs, it's a write action. It needs to eventually end up in some data store on the back end somewhere. Before that happens, we want to do some kind of check, is this evil? Should we allow this action to actually go ahead? And if the answer to that is yes, we might want to take some other action. So maybe we say, no, sorry, you can't post this. Maybe we show them a capture, whatever the case may be. So the system used to do the check, is this evil? That's what Sigma is. Um, so to give you a bit of an idea just quickly of what the architecture of this looks like, we basically have a C++ Haskell sandwich. So we've got at the top um, some C++, that's the server layer, so this is the Thrift C++ server. That then calls into a whole bunch of Haskell. So we've got the execution layer there, Haxel library, et cetera. Um, the key bit there is that client code. So this is what the Haxel, uh, the rules that are written in Haxel, uh, that's where they end up. And then at the bottom, we've got all these data sources. So this is other internal services, um, things like maybe like memcache uh, that we might want to communicate with to ask questions that are going to help us determine the answer to is this evil. And those data sources, they already existed, they were written in C++, so we haven't reinvented the wheel here. So we're going uh, and calling into Haskell from C++ and then using the Haskell foreign function interface to call uh, into the C++ at the bottom. So what do these rules actually look like? If we have a look in, in the client code section. This is a, an example of something you might have. So this is a rule for detecting if someone is spamming other people, their friends, about functional programming. And so the type there is this thing at the top, this Haxel ball. Uh, so Haxel is some computation, and it's going to return a result at the end, in this case of a ball. True or false, do we let this go through? Uh, I'm not going to explain all the syntax of what's going on here, but if we just look at this bit at the top where it has FB spammer equals, we've got three... Uh, computations here that we're doing. We're saying, is this person talking about monads? Uh, do they have more than 100 friends? And do most of those friends like Python? And these uh, computations are ordered uh, in order of how expensive they are. So telling if someone is talking about monads, we can see the function defined uh, in line there. For doing that, we're just going to check in the content. Does it contain the word monad? So that's a cheap check. Um, whereas figuring out if more than half of someone's friends like Python, that's going to be a much more expensive thing. We've got to go and get all their friends. That means talking to some uh, data store somewhere. And we've got to check for each one of those friends. Uh, is that a person that likes Python? How will we determine that? So at the top, uh, we've got this dot and and operator. Ignore the dot. This is just a convenience for Haxel things. Um, but this is typical programming stuff. Um, the ordering matters because if we do the talking about monads check, which is cheap, and that fails, we obviously don't want to bother to continue on and do those expensive checks. So we've got some explicit things that the program can do here to make this more efficient. What isn't explicit and isn't at all obvious from this is that in this friends like Python uh, function at the bottom, we've got a whole bunch of implicit things going on, thanks to Haxel, to do automatic batching and concurrency of the requests to different data sources that need to be made uh, for this. And there's nothing there that would tell you that. There's no fork, there's no, no concurrency constructs. This is something that happens uh, through the ma magic of Haxel, and it's deliberately done this way, because we don't want programmers to have to explicitly specify what they want uh, to have done concurrently and how that should happen, because programmers often get that wrong. So this is something that we just do through Haxel um, under the hood, and that's what the big win of Haxel is this efficient data fetching. So we're implicitly batching multiple requests to the same data source, we're implicitly requesting data from multiple data sources concurrently, and we're also doing caching in this system. So wherever there's some request for some bit of data, if someone makes that same request somewhere else, 
Um, that's going to be cache, so it's not going to be an expensive computation. That's not something the programmer has to think about. They can still write their program in a nice modular way, however they would, without worrying about that. So that's the big win of, of Haxel. Um, and that happens, at least the part that I've showed you here, through this applicative do extension. So even people here who, who might know Haskell and are familiar with do syntax and what it does, it does this desugaring process, something to do with monads that I'm not going to explain. Um, but the way it's happening here is actually different. This is a special extension that we implemented so that rather than desugaring to monad, it desugars to something called applicative instead, and that's where the concurrency stuff happens. So this is something that we've open sourced, this extension, by the way, and it's going to be coming to GHC, the Glasgow Haskell compiler, so it's the Haskell compiler that we use, uh, in the next version, 8.01. And in fact, Haxel itself is, of course, an open source project. You can find it on GitHub. We've got the link for that at the end. And a bunch of the contributions that we have made to Haskell and GHC have also, um, you know, we've passed those back upstream to them. So we've got allocation limits now in GHC, and we fixed a few bugs in the course of this project uh, in the garbage collector in GHC. So that was Haxel. I'm going to move on to the first one of these stories, and that is Haskell is academic. It's not for production, not for the real world. It's this fringe language that doesn't perform. And this is, this is quite a popular story. You hear this kind of thing a lot. Uh, here's one little example from XKCD. <laughs> Yeah, so <laughs> you get this thing from outside the community, there is this perception, but also from inside the community. I found this interesting image when I was looking for Haskell things, and I, I don't read uh, Russian, so I didn't understand this, but if you look up here, there's a clue to what they're talking about, and that's that PHP. Um, so I went to the trouble of, of translating this, uh, and so here we go, we've got all oh, the ideal monads, lambda calculus, algebraic data types versus what they say is the real world. I end up writing in PHP and spit, spit, whatever that means, and then I get used to it. <laughs> so from both inside and outside the community, there's this perception that often Haskell isn't really used in, in the real world. What's the reality? How does this story stack up? Well, Haskell is academic in that it came from academia. Uh, and it is still firmly established there. So Haskell is a language, if you weren't aware, that is designed by a committee. Back in the 80s, there are all these non-strict, purely functional languages around, uh, and it was decided that, hey, we're all doing the same kind of thing. Let's consolidate this effort. And that's where Haskell came from. So the first Haskell report, published back in 1990, on April 1, no joke, April Fool's Day is when they came out with this. Uh, and there's a wonderful paper called A History of Haskell that goes into the details of that, definitely worth reading. And one snippet from that that I found really interesting, which isn't highlighting on here as nice as it should be, but point one there. They talk about what were the goals for this language. And up front, it's very clear that they wanted Haskell to be a useful language. They say they want it to be for teaching, research, and applications, including building large systems. So right from the start, this was not designed to be something that was in the ivory tower alone. And, and that legacy continues even today. There are still lots of research papers that use Haskell. Haskell is still used in academia. There's also lots of real world development and innovation. Also interesting there, I think, point three, that it should be freely available. So open source values are also something that's been part of Haskell right from the start. Um, but this connection with academia, I'd argue that it's a good thing. I mean, this is a positive. We're getting the best language features from researchers who are super passionate about type theory and category theory and all these other wonderful theoretical underpinnings. And I mean super passionate. Um, <laughs> this guy <laughs> is Philip Wadler, who was uh, mentioned by Tony this morning. He wrote the theorems for free paper that was talked about this morning. So passionate about lambda calculus that he ends his talks by ripping his shirt open. <laughs> um, and he also has an awesome talk, and that's what this is from, uh, called Propositions as Types, where he talks about this thing called the Curry-Howard correspondence uh, between logic and programming, and how logicians tend to get there first with all these uh, groundbreaking concepts. They discover them before programmers do. I think that's kind of often true with academic and industry programming too. Many innovations in programming come from research initially, rather than necessarily from real world, real world use. So, you know, the researchers are worth listening to. They provide many of these amazing, powerful techniques which we can then use uh, commercially. So I don't think coming from academia is such a bad thing. But Haskell is most definitely used in industry. It isn't the most popular commercial language by any measure that you can find, but I don't think it can really be called fringe anymore. There are plenty of non-academic users of Haskell. And that includes big companies, and this is just a very small selection of big companies that have been known to be using Haskell. 
uh, as well as a whole bunch of smaller companies and startups. It's at both ends of the spectrum. Uh, and the ones that are links here, they're all companies that have written about their use of Haskell, or done talks or whatnot. And this is doing things like web apps, like this isn't niche stuff. Uh, DSLs like Haskell, uh, the Haxel one that we've done, compilers, rapid prototyping, like this is a general purpose language that can be used for whatever. So companies are using Haskell. It's perhaps not that widely known in the programming community, but when people find out, they get excited. Uh, I found this comment on Hacker News. If Facebook is able to use it in production, then Haskell is no longer an academic language. I would tell my boss that we can use Haskell because Facebook is using it. So, you know, if that's what you're waiting for to get Haskell into your workplace, the time is now because <laughs> Facebook is using it and as well as Google, Microsoft, Finder, all these other companies. It certainly is in the industry. The part, though, that you might want to study up on before tackling your boss is why are all these companies using Haskell? What are the benefits? So Haskell has many features that make it very well suited to real-world applications, just as its inventors intended, as we saw. Uh, for Haxel, at least, I think one of the, the big ticket items for that is the ability to reason about code, which we've already talked about quite a bit today. Or in other words, the ability to draw conclusions about it uh, using only the information that you have in front of you, which has lots of nice flow-on effects for things like testing and refactoring and concurrency or whatnot. And that ability to reason about Haskell code uh, flows from a few other things. Purity, so we talked again a little bit about this today already. Uh, if you give a function the same arguments, you always get back the same results without any observable side effects, and we can build referentially transparent functions out of these, uh, referentially transparent expressions, sorry, out of these functions like Tony talked about this morning. Um, and this comes from the laziness of Haskell. Things need to be pure, because if you're not sure uh, how things are gonna be evaluated, if the evaluation order is demand-driven, then if you did have side effects, you couldn't possibly you know, reason about how that's going to go on. So this is something that flows from laziness. The other thing, which again, we've talked about a bit today, uh, is Haskell's strong static typing. And we, we talked about parametricity and the goodness of that that can flow from these types. Haskell has a whole bunch of goodies in its type system. We've got algebraic data types, which I think have already been mentioned, uh, type classes, higher kind of polymorphism, all these things that help us to keep our code safe and, and dry. Uh, so the type safety we get in Haskell uh, helps to, pre to prevent whole classes of errors. It makes the code more robust. And in Haskell, that's been really important. It's one of the reasons that Haskell was chosen for this project. It means that the policies that contain all these Haskell, Haskell rules, um, they can't interact, they can't crash the rules engine, and they're easier to, to test and refactor. So to give a simple but very much real-world example, uh, so Haxel replaced another language that was an in-house Facebook-built language called FXL, and that language was also functional but interpreted, and it did have strong and static types, but it didn't have user-defined data types. There's no algebraic data types. Uh, in that kind of system, you end up with functions maybe like this. So we want to check if some user has some association with something else in the graph, and so for the association and for the other thing in the graph, we have some ID, some int that comes in. What ends up happening with a function like this? Well, at some point, someone probably flips the ints, right? They use the ID of the target object uh, as the uh, soak. Um, so what can we do? Well, in FXL, not that much, but in Haskell, the solution is pretty easy. We have this new type thing. We can wrap the int in some other type, and now these things are distinct. An ID and, and a sock ID, completely different things. Now we can write a function with a type signature like this instead, and that means that if someone does accidentally flip those numbers, the compiler will yell at them. Uh, and that's really important. And that's you know, a very, very simple example, but we can take our types uh, and go um, much further down this path towards making things safe and preventing these kind of bugs. There are also benefits with regards to concurrency. So it's easy to run functions concurrently when they're pure. You don't have to worry about this side affecting stuff. Uh, and it's thanks to the laziness and the purity in Haskell that in Haxel we can do the automatic batching and concurrency that I've talked about. And also actually we do automatic memoization of top level computations, which is a nice optimization. And these things flow from what the Haskell language gives us, the way that we can reason about code. And finally, uh, we use Haskell because Haskell performs. So Facebook chose to move to Haskell among other reasons because this FSL language was an interpreted language and it was slow. GHC, the Glasgow Haskell compiler, is a mature optimizing compiler and the Haskell code we write with it is fast. And latency is pretty key for a system like Sigma. It's handling more than a million requests a second 
And the user is waiting when these requests come in. They've just written their Facebook post and they're waiting to see if it goes through. Like This can't be a slow system. Um, we found that Haskell performs as much as three times faster than FXL did for certain requests and there was an overall boost of 30% in throughput when the system was moved to Haskell. So certainly much faster, also very stable, basically doesn't crash. We did find a couple of bugs in the garbage collector one which had been around for many years. So there's some little exception to that but these are now fixed. Uh, for the most part this is a very, very stable solution um, and also much faster to deploy than things were with FXL. So another thing that we implemented in Haskell uh, was the, Haskell already had a, a built-in runtime linker. Uh, we also implemented uh, unlinking so that we can basically hot deploy these rules. Uh, basically the code that's in uh, our Git repo at any stage, sorry, Mercurial repo, uh, is what's in production. So people write these rules like the ones I showed and they go straight into prod and they get linked in um, with GHC. So. Again, very awesome, fast performance. So, next myth, next story I want to move on to is that Haskell is difficult. And when people say this, there's a few different things that they mean. This is you know, potentially a multi-part story. So sometimes they mean Haskell is difficult to learn. Uh, another one I often hear is that Haskell is difficult to debug. Haskell is a difficult to hire and just that Haskell is a difficult. <laughs> so let's uh, have a look at each of these in turn. First up, Haskell is difficult to learn. Certainly not hard to find evidence that, that people think this is true. Um, wow, that's barely readable, but it really doesn't need to be. You can see there's a whole bunch of stuff going on, on that slide, and yeah, Haskell, don't even bother trying to learn it, apparently. So I can see that there is some truth to the story, but I think a better way to frame it would not be that Haskell is ne necessarily difficult, but that Haskell is different. Uh, I've spent a bit of time pondering this. I've actually talked to a couple of the inventors of Haskell to get their thoughts, um, read blog posts from new Haskellers, talked to different people, and we also ran a survey of our Haskell users, so I read all the comments in there. And there, there are three aspects to this story that I saw come up again and again. The first one, expectations. People who have development experience often come to Haskell expecting to pick it up really quickly and expecting to be able to map the concepts that they already know from other languages to Haskell concepts. And that often just doesn't work. Haskell is very different to most other languages. It's based on a, a really different way of thinking about computation, lambda calculus. Uh, so people's expectations often turn out to be wrong. I like to say that learning Haskell is a journey. You have to learn to think in a new way. And that sometimes takes people by surprise. Um, one comment you often hear about this is that people with existing programming experience actually have a harder time learning Haskell because they have to unlearn some things first. Uh, and I think there's some truth in that. I was talking to a person that teaches Haskell in university and they did say that often uh, the beginners did better than the people with development experience in some ways, not in terms of tooling, but in terms of actually just using the language. But interestingly, they often thought they were doing worse than they really were. So even for them, there were some issues with expectations. The second theme that I've noticed that comes up again and again is this word that's been thrown around a lot today, abstraction. Haskell is very powerful, but it also takes some time to get up to speed with a lot of the abstractions that are actually very common. So there's, there's a quite a high upfront learning cost when you come to Haskell, at least higher than a lot of other languages. Uh, and Haskellers know this, uh, everyone goes through it. Yes, lens is hard. Um, and it, you know, it's difficult for everyone. I've also talked to people um, that I consider like, you know, kind of rock star Haskellers who have kind of admitted to me, oh yeah, it took me three times to get through a category theory book. Like these really abstract concepts, they do take some time to get a handle on. And it's also, uh, it also means that there isn't often one clear way to do things in Haskell. There's sometimes many ways to do things and that's a real struggle for beginners because it's not clear which abstraction they should necessarily use. But there is an interesting contrast here because the core ideas of functional programming are actually really simple to explain and understand. Uh, and I was talking to John Hughes, another one of the creators of Haskell about this, and he said something like this, which I thought captured it quite nicely. Functional programming is simple. The core ideas are simple, and this is true. This is where this contrast comes in. But abstraction can be hard, but it doesn't mean it's not worth learning. So there is a journey there, and I think if we manage people's expectations about that journey to learn these abstractions, they're going to have a much better time. So Haskell's rich type system offers a lot of safety, as I've mentioned, 
uh, but it also means there are these many weird and wonderful type errors. And complaints about those type errors are the third common theme that I noticed. Falling in love with Haskell's type checker is a process. You now have two problems. You have what went wrong with my code and also why did the type checker reject this? And explaining those type errors is not easy for a beginner. But again, I think if we can manage expectations and convince people to persist, it's worth it because once you get past that, these types are powerful and very consistent. So in the words of uh, so the folks from Hasura, one of the Haskell startups I had on my slide earlier, they say, the promise of something that's hard to use but increases productivity by a few orders of magnitude, it's a pretty solid and sensible promise. We do use Vim after all. <laughs> Which is amusing, but you know, it's also a very good point. Anything unfamiliar does take some time to learn, but it's worth putting in the effort to master a good tool. So what about with Haxel? So switching from this FXL language, the in-house language to Haxel, meant we had to teach dozens of people Haskell. And that included both engineers and non-engineers. A lot of the people that write these Haxel rules are not engineers. So how do you do that? Well, we taught a three-day course, even three days to get up to speed. And the basic approach is that we just didn't mention this stuff. The word <laughs> monad is not in the tutorial. Uh, we didn't go into the details of any of these abstractions unless people were pushing the boundaries and asking for that. Uh, and we did eventually offer people operators like monadic bind and the infix fmap and all of that because some people asked for them. But uh, normally we stuck to do notation, we stuck to the things that were simple uh, and tried to make things like, you know, implicit, like all this implicit concurrency rather than getting people entangled in all of that. And of course we didn't just leave it to the, the three day course, we also created a Facebook group called Haxel Therapy where people <laughs> could come in and ask their questions. Uh, and the questions that people asked there and the, the user survey that we did that I mentioned, they reflect that the Haxel users have, uh, they've experienced these same frustrations that I talked about. Confusion over type errors, feeling like it took them quite a while to get proficient. But nonetheless, overall, um, I think the transition has been a huge success. Um, we asked how comfortable people were writing Haxel to do their job as part of the survey. <laughs> it's a bit like that. <laughs> Uh, and the average response was a touch out under four on a five point scale, which meant, <laughs> I really shouldn't have let this repeat, should I? Um, meant people somewhat agree that they are comfortable writing Haxel, which is pretty good only a few months in after the migration. Well, some people do still struggle. Um, others have gone off and started adding their own data types, making their own tests, building their own abstractions. So that's really encouraging. Overall, people have taken to this. Our next myth. Haskell is difficult to debug. So again, I think there is truth to this, but it's part of a trade-off in the design of the language that uh, the designers were aware of from the very start. Again, it's something that's mentioned in the Haskell history paper. So laziness is awesome, but it is hard to predict the space usage of lazy programs. It's admittedly true, but there are profiling tools for finding space leaks in Haskell programs, and there are things that you can do to deal with them. You can add strictness, uh, when you need to, but these things are hard to spot in advance. But the benefit of laziness is the purity and the reasoning and the things I've already talked about earlier. So this is a trade-off that's deemed to be worth it. Uh, and while debugging in Haskell is a bit different to other languages, uh, there can be benefits too. So doing everything in this pure style actually spawns some new debugging techniques. We have all these post-mortem debugging approaches where you basically just capture all the relevant input and then replay it later to debug. And we have something kind of similar to that uh, in Haxel. So uh, I mentioned that we cache the results of all the calls to these data sources. So that also means that at the end of the computation, you can save that cache down, and that can form the basis of a test that you run later. Or you can replay the computation and, and use that to figure out exactly what's happened and, and analyze the performance and whatnot. So yes, some aspects of debugging can be difficult in Haskell. But I think, again, a better way to frame it is just that they're different. Next up, Haskellers are difficult to hire. Who's heard this out of interest? Who's had, this, had their boss use this as an excuse not to use Haskell? Yeah, a few. So who doesn't use Haskell at work but wishes they did? Okay, quite a lot, yeah. I think this is just simply false. Um, there are fewer Haskell jobs out there than there are people who want to write Haskell and I think the talent standard is pretty high. Um, seen this to be true at Facebook and online commentary seems to suggest it's true elsewhere too. Uh, I found an article from Ben Ford, Finder, one of these other Haskell startups, and the way he put it is that anyone looking to hire a Haskell team faces an embarrassment of riches. 
Uh, he also claims that if you, if you choose Haskell in the end, you need fewer developers because um, yeah, it takes fewer developers with Haskell to create exceptional work. And of course, the other point to make here is you don't have to hire people who already know Haskell. You can train people to write Haskell. Uh, that's what we did with Haskell. We tr trained even non-developers to write Haskell. Good developers can learn anything. It can be done. And finally, we uh, come to what is perhaps the most confronting story in this category, <laughs> that Haskellers are difficult. So functional programmers, including and sometimes especially <laughs> Haskellers, they do have a bit of a reputation of being uh, slightly fanatical. Uh, and this came out strongly in the Lambda Ladies story, a uh, Lambda Ladies survey I did um, a year or so ago. Uh, so Lambda Ladies is a, a group for women in functional programming uh, that I co-founded. And I did a bit of a survey of people to try and dig into this. And I got comments like, in many FB communities, there's a strong vein of elitism. Uh, it seems to create a culture of intellectual territoriality, and it's <laughs> unfriendly to outsiders. And there's simply always too much showing off and never enough treating people with respect. So these comments are pretty disappointing, at least for those of us who would like to grow the community. Why do people think this? So I've, uh, given the difficulties that we talked about earlier and how different Haskell is, I think some of this perception may well have a lot to do with the language that we use. Um, I was reading a book recently on the history of English words and it had a section on jargon. Uh, and I had a snippet that I found really striking. It says, People only start condemning such language as jargon when the insiders talk to outsiders in an unthinking or pretentious way, using obscure words without considering the effect on their listeners. Ouch. So there was no mention of programmers in this book, but this old chestnut came to mind when I was reading this. <laughs> I think it's a pretty good description of what can happen with Haskellers. So we climb this Haskell abstraction ladder and see how amazing all these things are and then promptly forget to talk to how to talk to the people at the bottom and don't understand why they think we're jerks when we start using all this jargon. So this is something I think we need to be really careful about, to take care of what we say. Um, but there are some things that we can do to combat this story. Um, one area the online commentary suggested was that Haskell sometimes falls short in terms of documentation because there's this prevailing attitude that types of documentation and that's all you should, you should need. And that may well be true if you're familiar with the abstractions being used, but many libraries could probably do better at providing some more examples that are really beginner friendly for people who aren't quite there yet. And I think this is arguably even more important now that uh, the foldable and traversable proposal has been implemented in Haskell, it's arguably, arguably reduced the accessibility of the Haskell language. Uh, another area we can combat this perception that Haskellers are difficult is by or working to create a diverse, respectful community. Uh, former Linux kernel developer Sarah Sharp, who recently left kernel development quite publicly, uh, has written a bit about what makes a good tech community, and I have the links to that at the end of my slides. Um, she has some great things to say about it, and I think it's well worth reading. Uh, she talks about needing communication that is technically brutal, but personally respectful. And I think that's really apt. The key to fighting this perception is respect and respectful communication. So finally, Haskell is panacean, the best language around, and choosing it will solve all your problems. Or in other words, the functional way is the right way. <laughs> <laughs> there tends to be some hyperbole around Haskell and functional programming. Uh, sometimes it's spoken about as if the language or paradigm choice is more important than the problem being solved. Haskell and functional programming are great tools, but they're not perfect tools. And I don't just mean because Haskell is not a total language, as Tony mentioned this morning. <laughs> So the reality is you can write terrible code in Haskell. And I know because I've seen it in Haxel. We had hundreds of thousands of lines of this FXL code that was auto-translated to Haxel. Uh, and not only is a lot of this translated code terrible, the new developers that we've got now writing new rules, they see that and then copy it. So we end up with new code that's terrible with you know, variable names that are ending in arbitrary numbers and uh, what we call code tornadoes. So this is an example Haxel rule uh, for blocking Australians, but based on the colourful language they use. I didn't come up with this example, my colleagues did. Um, you probably can't read it very well, but that's not important. The key thing here is the shape. Uh, and this is a small one. I've seen code tornadoes in the Haxel code base that are hundreds of lines long, like way too big to fit on a slide. Um, so there are all kinds of things in our code base that are not pretty. 
And switching to Haskell and Haxel, that did not make everything beautiful. It did not magically solve these kinds of problems. At the end of the day, Haskell and FP are just tools. Uh, so when we're out there talking about these things, I think it's worth bearing in mind whether or not we're trying to motivate other programmers to use functional programming, to use Haskell, or to motivate them to write good code and respectfully demonstrating that these are tools that can be used to achieve that. As Brian has tweeted, hey Brian, <laughs> good to see you here. Um, using functional programming is a conclusion from a goal, not the goal itself. I think it's also worth remembering that it takes time and effort to educate people uh, about an unfamiliar language and its benefits. Uh, so Paul Graham wrote about this. He said, ordinarily, technology changes fast, but programming languages are different. Programming languages are not just technology, but what programmers think in. They're half technology and half religion. And there are religious wars around types, around laziness, around functional programming. Well, we know, of course, that there are always trade-offs involved. It's the classic computer scientist answer. It depends. I think that spreading ideas is more important than winning some religious war. And ideas from functional programming in Haskell have been spreading. I mean, there are functional features of some type now in most mainstream imperative languages, uh, and even on the typing side. I think most of the, the popular dynamic languages now have some form of optional typing or type hinting or whatnot. So these ideas are advancing our languages, and actually, that's exactly what the Haskell designers wanted. So in the Haskell history paper, it says, we believe the most important legacy of Haskell will be how it influences the languages that succeed it. It's not about getting everyone to use Haskell, the one language to rule them all, no, but about spreading good ideas. So what can we conclude from all of this? So yes, Haskell is academic in that it comes from academia, but yet it is also very much a practical language that is used in industry and will continue, I believe, to, to be used in industry. Haskell is different from many other languages, and that brings lots of benefits. Um, but it also brings some challenges, such as making sure that we create a language community that is welcoming to beginners and help them to climb that abstraction ladder. And Haskell is, it is merely a tool. It's not utopia, it's not a panacea, it's not going to solve all your problems. But it's a good tool, and it's got lots of great ideas, uh, which are worth learning about and, and worth spreading. So maybe not everyone can be so lucky as to use Haskell at work, but hey, this is a room of open source people, so you can choose to use Haskell or other functional languages in your own open source projects. So let's go forth and write open source things in Haskell with excellent documentation and beginner friendly examples, of course. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge the, the Haskell team, past and present, there's been a whole bunch of people who have contributed to this project. And here are all my references to the different uh, quotes and articles that I've mentioned along the way, as well as uh, links to where you can actually dig in and learn a bit more about Haxel and the specifics of the monad and the applicative functor instance and whatnot and how all this concurrency happens. Because Haskell, as demonstrated by the Haxel project, is indeed for production. So please go out and make Haskell in production less surprising. Thank you.